Welcome everyone. Sorry for the delay. We had a little technical hiccup. But um, as technical things do, we got it all worked out. So um, welcome. And my name is Rebecca Lewis, and I am the Visitor Services Specialist at the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. And along with the Ottawa, the Friends of the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. Um, they are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1997 to support Ohio's only national wildlife refuge. <clears throat> and uh, they support us with, uh, they support youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. And I got to spend some time on their, one of their um, acquisitions today, and I really, it made my whole day better. Um, so, of course, we're located along the southern shore of Lake Erie near Oak Harbor and some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. And if you're inter interested in learning more, um, we will put a link to their website in the chat and um, it will point you in the direction to become a member, um, make a tax deductible donation or to support their work. And today we are joined by Laura Kammermeyer with Cornell. And she has graciously joined us today to share her program. And before we will begin, we will ask that you stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenter. And you can type any questions in the chat box as we go. Laura, do you prefer questions as we go along or save them to the end? How about if we save them to the end, if that's right. okay? And maybe somebody read the chat and, you know, and cover that for me. That'd be helpful. All right. Then we will turn it over to Laura Kammermeyer. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So let me put on my screen here, make sure everyone can see it. Okay. Then bring you guys over here. All right. So does everyone see the beautiful snowy owl? All right. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm um, really pleased to be here. I know Rebecca and I go way back from the times that I've been to Western Ohio. I'm an Ohio native myself. I was born and raised in um, the east of Cleveland area in Euclid. And I spent a lot of time as a kid in Lakeside, Ohio, long before it was a true Chautauqua. Uh, and then I came back as an adult when I started being passionate about birding. So I've spent a lot of time over there birding with friends, going to the festivals, and uh, it's just an absolutely lovely place. So uh, yeah, about me, I've worked in birds for about 25 years. Um, I, I've worked mostly in the fields of communication, education, and citizen science. And uh, my role at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology right now is as the business manager for Birds of the World. So it's basically my job to get Birds of the World in the hands of as many people as possible, where it can do some good and inspire new people ab um, about bird life. So today I'm gonna cover, my, my talk is gonna cover three parts and I'll try to go fast. It's a little bit long, just so you know, but I'm gonna to try to go as fast as I can. Um, part one is gonna be what you can do with Birds of the World. And, and then part two will be telling you about how it connects to the lab's larger mission of bending the curve for birds. And then three, I wanna highlight one of our partner collaborations that shows how, we're, how, how the things that we're doing at the lab translate into broader conservation messages. I'm going to make a change here. Okay, great. Um, so Birds of the World essentially is a, is a collection of definitive life histories of every bird in the world. It's an online subscription resource that contains a deep well of natural history information. It's global, it's scholarly, it's dynamic. And at the end of the day, Birds of the World is there to teach you about the birds of your world, whether you're just looking to bird at home and waiting for that Kirtland's world bird to come in, or whether you do some travel, say to Texas or to Panama or to Brazil or Thailand. Basically, this resource is always there online, capable of going with you, and it's not as heavy as <laughs> the birds of Ecuador. <clears throat> The bedrock of birds of the world is 10,824 species accounts. These are in-depth life history profiles of every bird. I'll go over the, in detail a little bit what they, what they show in a bit. 
Um, but we also include 249 bird family accounts. And these family accounts are nice because they give us an overview of that bird family and allows you to visualize avian diversity across, across species. So a typical bird family account will show you the range of the species, how many genera, how many species in that family, and give you a lot of other information that help you, help you just understand bird families and birding then at a, at a much deeper level. Birds of, the, Birds of the World was launched in March of 2020, and it's the it's, it's result of merging four already popular and, and well-known works of ornithology. There was Birds of North America and Neotropical Birds, which were two online major online resources um, with, with species accounts. Uh, they, they were Cornell resources. And then we acquired the text to HBW Alive and Bird Families of the World, which was owned by uh, Lynx Editions. So we put all of this content together and then beefed up the content. We tried to settle all of these into a single taxonomy. We infused the content with a lot of photos, videos, and sound recordings. And the resulting product put the life history of the world's world, birds into sharper focus. So again, each profile is infused with media. The lab has what's called the, the Macaulay Library. And if you haven't heard of what that is, Macaulay Library is uh, one of the oldest wildlife media archives in the world. And it was started in 1929 by Arthur A. Allen. He was an ornithologist, one of the ones who, who um, the person who, who took the first and last photo of the ivory bill. Okay, I'll press on. Great. Um, right, so the Macaulay Library has millions of pieces of media, photos, videos, and sound recordings. And we have assets, we've, we've collected the top rated access, assets of each, of each species that is in there, and then imported them into Birds of the World. So you can basically, the, 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 the media assets allow you to bring Birds of the World to life, essentially, about birds to life. Um, the Macaulay Library was recently expanded too. We have a great selection of Asian bird media from the Oriental Bird Club. That's some um, imagery that we acquired from them. And we also acquired the Internet Bird Collection, which, give us, which gave us a lot of media from the Old World species as well. Um, the, the, the life history accounts also have scientific illustrations for every species and most subspecies, which is something you won't find very often. Um, the, these uh, carefully drawn depictions, again, allow you to study differences in birds within and among species. And it includes an assortment of range maps for every species. You've got your standard distribution map, which is usually an eBird map or perhaps one um, developed by BirdLife. But then it also includes the, a lot of animated abundance maps, which show you the, the, the seasonal abundance and migration as the birds migrate from their southern territories to their northern. So with these expanding set of eBird science and trends maps, we know with more accuracy than ever before how birds are moving across the earth in space and time. And while some of these map products are available for free in eBird, what Birds of the World does, what the, what the editors and scientists of Birds of the World do, is, is take it a step further and give you context and interpretation of the results. So again, each profile provides in-depth authoritative information about birds over its full life cycle, you know, from the nest, from the egg, the nest, all the way to adult stage. And it covers up to 70 different articles that cover different aspects of the bird's life history. So there's really no better way to explore what birds of the world is than to dig into a species profile together. So let's, let's do that. I noticed that a yellow breasted chat was seen at Metzger Marsh on May 27th, maybe even later than that. But let's find out what birds of the world can teach us about the chat. So as, as Many of you know, I'm sure the chat is a frequently overlooked and seldom seen bird, but it's loud and it has these distinctive vocalizations that really are the only clue to its presence. The chat is the largest of our warblers and is a widespread breeder found in shrubby habitats across North America and it ventures down to Central America for the winter. And when you go to the, to the landing page for the yellow-breasted chat, you know, basically you just would put, put in the species that you're looking for or the family in the search bar, it calls up the, the profile. So the, the, this is what we call the hero, the hero image and the hero part of the, of the profile, and it contains a lot of information. 
First, you can just click on the images. There are several images. If you click on the, uh, on the images, then you can scroll through a number of really carefully selected images that, again, cover the species in, in every stage of its life cycle, male, female, adult, juvenile. And then you'll also be delivered a, um, a top-rated video as well as top-rated sound of that species. Um, over here to the left, we can find information about, you know, of course, the, the common name of the bird, the scientific name of the bird, the conservation status. And this, this shows that there's 23, in our database, there are 23 ways to say yellow-breasted chat in various languages. So we provide the languages that that bird is, um, um, other names for that bird in different languages. This says, shows us that there's two subspecies recognized for the chat, and I'll show that in more detail in a minute. And um, these, these, these profiles are constantly being updated. So this one was revised and released just on January 21st. And the authors of this account, it's always important to credit the people who, who, who developed this account. The authors were Charles Thompson and Kevin Eberly, right? So there's a lot of information covered there. These, these are what we call eBird, uh, eBird badges. And this shows me if that blue is checked, and if it's showing blue for me, it means I've seen the, the bird and I've put that sighting into eBird. And if I've actually uploaded a photo or an audio recording too, then those lights will, will build up too. So there's a lot of people who are involved in our projects that are really thrilled about seeing those blue lights turn on. So they, oh yes, I saw the bird, I photographed the bird, and I, I took a sound recording. So this little eye right here, if you open it up, you can, you can see the, um, um, the etym there's information on the etymology of the scientific bird name. There's this massive work done by a gentleman in England who gave us his content because we knew that we could basically give, give it a um, really premium spot within Birds of the World. And it just, he's really glad that we have it. He's worked his whole life um, working on very extensive etymology descriptions of every scientific name. And these aren't just two or three lines. There's paragraphs of text that give you very distinct information about how the changes in the name, um, um, about how the, what the name means and how the changes of the name has, has, have evolved. Um, and embedded within that too is also what we call the original description, which is what scientists uh, refer to as the first paper that described that bird. So a lot of people, even just birders, really love to have that information because it helps them understand more about, um, under, understand the Latin and what it means for the bird, and therefore under, better understand their, um, you know, what they're looking at. So in our bird ID section, Right, We're, we, we provide a lot of information about the appearance of the bird, including plumage, molt, and su similar species. You know, so, so here we learn together that the chat is a lot, large warbler with a very long tail, and it's olive green, grayish olive on the back, and has a bright lemon yellow on its chin, its throat, and its breast, sometimes with a tinge of orange. And the face is, is grayish with these black lores, the white supercilium, and that very cute little white eye crescent on the bottom of the eye. So the, the de there's a lot of detail that um, in appearance that we go into, but that's just a, a snippet of it. So on the distribution section, we have a, um, a variety of maps, but we always have a, a lot of text to accompany those maps. So it goes into great detail about the distribution of the bird, not only in the East and the West and Central America. So um, we learn, for example, that the Eastern population is somewhat breeding population is somewhat separate from the Western breeding population. And that's important because it helped drive speciation in the chat. And so then we come back and we learn that the chat actually has two subspecies. And right now we recognize both the Western and the Eastern. There's Oracolis versus Viren's uh, subspecies. And they differ basically mostly on the color on the back. The Eastern species that you are familiar with would, be, would have more of this um, green olive. And this, the Western species has more of a grayer back. The Western may have more orange on its, on its front too, and um, the yellow might have a tinge of orange to it as well. So it's just interesting how, you know, how that, the breeding range kind of drew, drove some speciation, and we provide a lot of detailed information even beyond that 
Um, in addition to those photos, we have a uh, text that provides an overview of the systematics history of these birds because, you know, subspecies are recognized, then not recognized, and then they split. And so lips, splits and lumps all the time. So we provide an overview of how that goes, more details of its distribution, as well as an identification summary. Um, also right here, if you see these links, these blue hot links, one, um, the top one will allow you to click off to an eBird map that shows you the range of that subspecies, as well as the, the next one is for the photos. So our, let's see, is that the Western? Yeah, the Western chat has 102 different photos in our collection and about 51 sound recordings. So what this does, it, it allows you to really embrace subspecies you know, as you mature into a birder, subspecies become something that you might want to explore. And so it allows you to embrace them and grow confidence in being able to identify them based on looks and, and, um, and location. So the chat was long thought to be a very large but aberrant member of the Perulidae, the wood warbler family. But but the chat was recently recognized as having a distinct lineage and it was split into its own family, the Icteriidae. Sounds a lot, a lot like Icteridae, which is the blackbird family, but it's Icteriidae. Um, so I, as I mentioned, the Birds of the World contains two, the 249 bird family overviews, and this is the family page for the Icteriidae. There's more information on the bottom though, and that includes an overview of this family's habitat, diet and foraging, breeding, and conservation status. So again, images, images and text and, and detail about all of this. So we already learned that the species occurs in dense shrubby habitat, but the, go, the text goes into really a lot of detail about where the, the habitats that that bird can be observed in throughout its entire life cycle. Through, so we go into detail about the habitat in the breeding area, the non-breeding range, as well as during migration. So I often wonder where birds came from and where they're going. I wonder if they're early or if they're late. So, so Birds of the World provides a migration, an overview of their entire migration and the timing and the routes. So when you evaluate the text and, and, and the, relevant, the information that's relevant to your region, and you also incorporate analysis of our, of our animated migration maps, you really come away with a really deep picture of, of how this species, um, you know, when the species comes and goes. And for the chat, by the way, we learned that the adults begin leaving their breeding territory by early July, and by July 15th, they're largely silent and then a lot harder to find. Of course, the chat is all about the sounds that it makes. I wish I could play one for you. It's just, it's going to take a little bit too long. But it has a diverse, diverse vocal array. Males are most often heard at sunrise and singing from dense thickets, and sometimes it can be heard at night. A.A. Saunders said, the song of the yellow-breasted chat is not only entirely unlike that of any other warbler, but unlike that of any other bird with which I'm acquainted. And it's often described as a collection of whistles, cackles, mews, catcalls, call notes, chuckles, rattles, squawks, girl, gurgles, and pops. So <laughs> it's really got a, a, like I said, a very diverse vocal array. And um, it's never, the, it seems to be never the same, you know, from one time to the next. Um, the, the, the notes that it makes at night are more of a whistle, like a whistle note or a whistle song. And it often will sing from an exposed perch and do an exaggerated display flight onto the ground. And during this dis display flight, it just comes from a, comes from a large perch, um, high, uh, a high perch, falls down, it has exaggerated wing beats, and then it has its body at a 45 degree angle as it descends, which is kind of an odd, um, an, uh, an odd way for, it, for, for a descent for a bird. But yes, so they're powerful vocalists able to broadcast their song through dense shrubby uh, vegetation. So in the breeding section, we learn all about the bird's breeding phenology and its cycle. We learn that female lays a clutch of three to four eggs in a nest composed of grass, leaves, bark, and other materials. 
and the female incubates these eggs for about 11 to 12 days and tends to it mostly by herself. The hatchlings are born naked and needy, and the young uh, nestlings are brooded exclusively by the female. Both the male and the female are often involved in feeding the nestlings, and both have been observed removing fecal sacs. The nestlings typically fledge somewhere around day nine, and they're cared for by, by both their parents for another 10 days after nest departure. So these kind of details are super useful for to me because I've, I, I have a large yard and with a lot of nesting birds. And so I also happen to have a, a robin in my garage right now. So the number of days that I should expect that the robin sits on the eggs and the number of days from, you know, from hatching to fledging is really important to me because I need to know when I can close my garage door again. <laughs> so the, the, I refer to this kind of stuff all the time as a birder. So have, have you ever wondered, you know, seen a bird do something and wonder, is that a thing or is it just coincidence? And what does it mean? And what do they do it? What is it called? Well, with Birds of the World, there's a lot of information on a bird's behavior. So any of the standard behaviors that you might have heard a, a guide reference on, in the field, you can come to Birds of the World and read more about it in further detail. The male ye yellow-breasted chat, for example, is known for three interesting behaviors. I already mentioned the complex flight display. They're also known for loose coloniality. Uh, what happens there is that males, the, the territory of the males tend to have some overlap. So there's some thought that there's this loose coloniality, like almost, almost like a lacking, that they just kind of uh, nest in areas close to each other with slight overlap. Um, <clears throat> The other, the other behavior that they're known for is something called extraterritorial forays. So both sexes are known to go, on, go outside of their territories to explore. They're more likely to foray at night than during the day. And females tend to be kind of in their most fertile period when they do this. And they stay out a lot longer than the boys do. And sometimes the male will do what's called mate guarding, which is kind of uh, fly towards her and appear to nudge her back into the territory. And, and it's a good thing, I think, because the DNA studies have shown that the female, that the nestlings are sometimes fathered by another female, by another male outside that breeding pair. So, and you know, and the other, you know, the males are mostly monogamous during the breeding season, but some have been known to have two mates. So these are just some fascinating facts about the bird's life history. And, you know, there's, there's so much to learn about every bird that you, you couldn't imagine until you start getting into it. So the global conservation status of the bird is one of least concern, but you can understand the fullest context of, of this designation by getting into more details in both the conservation and management section, as well as the demography and population sections. So here we, we've explored just a little bit about the entire life history of the yellow-breasted chat, and there's a lot more to know about the bird. But it, so you can use it, you know, anytime you're hit with a question about a bird, any bird near or far, and it serves as a one-stop shop for that reliable bird information. As, as you might imagine, though, to be an accurate reflection of all currently available knowledge or science on this bird, and every bird, our work is ongoing and it's never done. And so you might wonder how we can sustain a project as big as this. Well, luckily, because we merged those four resources together, and those had been longstanding between 15 and 20 years old already, we had a really good start of material. So now we're engaged in updating these older accounts with new information. Our science team releases about four to six newly revised profiles every week, and we're building out an editorial team to make that happen even faster. So this is what our editorial structure looks like. We've got more than, well, more than 2,000 authors have contributed to these accounts, whether in the past or currently. And their work is facilitated by content partners, uh, an associate editor team, which is um, located in regions all around the world. We have somewhere around 35 or 37 different associate regional editors. And uh, we also have a retired team of technical writers who are doing our copy editing and they're just they're just doing a fantastic job as volunteers helping us out 
And this is all kind of organized by five science editors at the lab. So we have a really small team and that funnel, funnel of work, it's really narrow when you think about 10,824 bird species, uh, but we're working as fast as we can and building out teams to make it go even faster. So now I wanna show you a little bit about uh, how Birds of the World relates to the, to the lab's larger conservation mission. So, so the people in this room probably understand that the last 50 years, the US and Canada has lost 2.9 billion birds lost. And this red line signifies the downward trend in bird populations during that time from 1970 to 2020. And this loss of, has occurred across every ecosystem, and it's certainly indicative of a broader biodiversity crisis that's affecting insects and amphibians and other wildlife. And because birds are harbingers of things to come, we are, you know, we know that if they're in trouble, we're in trouble. So we're wondering how can we bend this curve? And the lab has approached this biodiversity crisis in a lot of ways. We know that engaged communities with science and technology can help us and others accomplish conservation at scale. So our goal is to measure the health of the planet through birds, and the more data we have to measure this health, the better, and that's where people like you come in. So by participating in citizen science projects, by using our app, uploading your media, you have provided a remarkable, remarkable amount of data that helps us measure birds. And as that data comes in, it's powered an increasingly sophisticated number of tools and analyses. And over the last five years, for example, we've begun to integrate our projects in such a way that we've powered, again, uh, produced feedback loops that have powered major growth in our, in our data, in data to interpret the world. It spawned more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, it's helped partners around the globe accomplish their local conservation projects, and it has also enabled these better features in Birds of the World. eBird is celebrating its 20-year anniversary, and submissions have grown by an average of 20% over the previous year consistently for the last five years. So more and more people are joining eBird, and that means more data for science and more information for other birders. So the milestone that we reached at the end of 2021 was 1.1 billion bird observations submitted to eBird over these 20 years. The Macaulay Library, the, the, the assets that people are donating to, well not donating, but storing in, in Macaulay Library are also increasing at such a pace. And we recently reached a milestone of 33 million photos and 1.2 million audio recordings. And so what we do is we take the photo, video, and audio recordings, we, we, we um, make a specially curated set for every bird. We now have a curated set of those three media assets for 76% of the world's birds. Thanks to people like you who, you know, who, who are using bird to submit data, photos, and audio recordings. So again, because of this, because we have such a broad usage across the world now, we're able to measure with greater accuracy than ever before how birds are moving across the earth in space and time and what they sound like and look like as they're doing it. So if you're contributing to the lab, we really appreciate it. This is a really complicated photo, but the idea is this, the integration of these projects is, re reduce, is, is creating these positive feedback loops eBird observations are feeding high resolution maps to both Birds of the World and Merlin, Bird ID app. The eBird media uploads feed the Macaulay Library. The Macaulay Library media is piped out to Birds of the World, eBird, and Merlin Bird ID app. And Merlin now is helping to rec recruit new eBirders who are new, like basically our partners in the fight to save birds, who will then submit their data and new media every day. <clears throat> So together we're building a life history data enterprise that's powering a broad discipline of ecological research questions at scale. So now I want to talk a little bit about how the, you know, highlight how date, this data ecosystem has been leveraged by one of our partners. 
lab partners all around the world are, are work with us. They share our mission to accomplish bird conservation at scale. They use our tools and um, we, we support their capacity to reach their constituents and so that we can work together to better save birds. And Bird Count India is just one of them. They're using the full suite of the Cornell tools and resources. They have a large number of engaged birders. And over the last 10 years, their eBird participation has exploded, which has given us a lot more data in India that we never had before. So now we're produce, able to produce maps that, that more accurately show where you know, the bird uh, distribution and abundance in all of India, which, be, which is now extremely useful to them, that feeds their ability to produce ma maps and data sets for their own research. And from this, they produced their very first State of the Birds report, which is the first national assessments of birds that they can share with, with stakeholders. They're also an extremely valuable partner in that they're a content partner for Birds of the World. They formed a team of 25 academic authors who are helping us, you know, providing regional expertise about birds, they're helping us produce um, produce and an update refresh content for our Indian birds. So with, without their expertise, their, their regional expertise, um, we probably wouldn't have got to some of these species yet. And if we did, it probably wouldn't have been as spot on because, you know, it's that local regional expertise that really helps us. So BirdCon India is a fantastic partner in this way. And we're looking to work with more partners like this all across the world. So if you ever wonder what, our, what the lab is doing during, during our downtime, we're thinking about how we can bend that curve for birds back up in the, in the right direction, but it's going to take all of us working together in order to see birds on the road to recovery. But we place hope on the wings of science and on bird enthusiasts like you and believe both of us will take you there. So if you use our tools, thank you uh, for doing so. It goes well beyond just you know, submitting your observations to a tool or you know just giving data away we're giving back by by sustaining and supporting other people um, not only growing our projects but really supporting others around the world like bird count india and others in in argentina and chile and and, and many others so thanks a lot i really appreciated speaking with you today and i also you know i hope i've given you a, a sense of what birds of the world truly is and if you're interested in it, um, you can get it at the website. Uh, let's say I don't have the website on there. It's birdsoftheworld.org. And everyone today gets a special introductory coupon. So if you want to jot that down, it's Ottawa Friends. Maybe I can write it down in the chat room too. It's all caps, Ottawa Friends, all caps at HTTP. So check it out, see if you like it. And if you want to reach out to me with any, you know, questions after tonight, I'm, I'm always open. Uh, my email is this. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I don't know if I went too fast or too slow, but thank you for, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So do we put the volume on for people to talk, Tom? I don't hear you. You're still muted. That's that's one way to do it. The other way, the people, if you wish to speak to Laura, just press your space bar and speak and she will hear you. Hmm. But I, um, you can unmute yourself now, I believe. By, by going into the participant lock in the bottom of your screen, finding your name and unmuting yourself. Uh, Paul. You birdsoftheworld.org? Yeah, birdsoftheworld.org, great. Right. Okay, thank you. I just wonder if there's any eBird users here. I'm just curious if anyone 
uses. I have. Food. Yeah. I have. How do you like it? I do. Um, my friend Kelly has used it a lot more than I have, and that's mm -hmm. what's got me started on it. And she mm -hmm. really likes it too. Great, great. One of the nice things about it again is that eBird badge. So if you if you have your data in eBird, mm -hmm. then it reflects in the in the profile as well. And then you could just link, you know, click on the profile, the set, you know, if you um, click on the blue badge and then it takes you back to your checklist where you saw that bird. So you can, it creates this little ecosystem that you can be in. And for me, what it does, because I'm in, you know, I'm a, I'm a big birder. So I love, I love seeing all my data. I've traveled many places in the world, but I'm not traveling right now, like many of us aren't. So I've gone in, I've put all these historical travel, um, world travel lists in, and now I can go back and I could see which birds, you know, when I, when I surf birds of the world, I say, oh, I saw that, but where did I see that? And when did I see that? You know? Right. So it, for me, it's sort of like building the legacy between eBird and birds of the world. So eBird is storing the, the the facts and the whens in my images, but Birds of the World is telling the story of the birds, you know, through through that lens. So this is more of like an app. So Birds of the World is a website only. Okay. You don't give an app because it's just too large. It's more than a hundred thousand pages of content. So, so you subscribe to the website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joe uses it. TJ uses it. I know TJ uses everything. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I'll be happy to listen to your questions uh, if you write me by email. Importance of hotspots and reporting by county hotspot, for example. Yeah, so I think the commenter is. Yeah. So the hotspot, I think that the only way, okay, so what happens sometimes is, is when you report to a hotspot, you find the nearest hotspot to you. But sometimes the hotspots have a little bit of overlap. So you might choose one that maybe, I don't think you can be wrong but it might not be the best for that situation. And, and there's only a few people who, who would really care about that. <laughs> but um, I think the guidance, Paul, comes from the regional editor, if you can find that person. Yeah, I think that comes from better eBird training. So Paul's saying that many people start in one county and then leave it run for many miles into, into Lucas. So what happens there? So that comes down to local training that people can, can teach each other. So the active birders in, you, in your region could make an effort to teach other birders to use it um, better because those regions are so specific and this, this is very important to you. So if there's any way to you to, for you to work with local bird clubs and do local trainings on that, I think it would work better um, because people at Cornell, I don't think we really have the insight as to what matters in your county. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What birds have you been seeing lately? Was there a Kirtland's warbler this year? I think there was, right? Great. Uh, yes, Laura, there was on the, uh, on the refuge along the uh, estuary trail leading from McGee Marsh to the refuge. Nice, nice. Many nice. people got to see that. Boardwalk too, there were multiple this year. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe they did out by the parking lot. They saw it the one day. So nice. Uh, on the yeah, on the very west end. Oh, it's been a long time since I've seen one. A long I think, time. Um, they spotted both the male and the female this year, didn't they, TJ?
Uh, say it again, Judy. Sorry, I'm not very well, you know. Say it again. That's okay. I thought somebody said, I think Janice Farrell had seen the female, and then there was also the male there too um, on the Kirtlands. Yeah, I think there were two or three different Kirtland wobblers. I'm thinking there were maybe right. at least two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Great. I think Paul is saying there were five to six, you know, in the area. Yeah. Mm hmm. Thank you, Laura. All it's right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. All right. You guys have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.